Well, hello and welcome to this episode of The Terry Cole Show, where I am talking about anxiety, how to manage anxiety in um, an anxious time. A lot of you have been emailing me and asking me for effective ways to manage it. Um, how can you tell if you have anxiety? And this is a this is a time where even people who do not normally feel anxious are feeling anxious with everything that we've sort of been dealing with with the last few months, pandemic, sheltering in place, things changing. That can be very anxiety provoking for pretty much anyone. So depending on where you are on the spectrum, um, that really dictates what level of anxiety this um, pandemic might be um, creating for you. Or maybe you just feel anxious normally and you would like effective, easy ways to manage your anxiety better. So that is what this entire episode of the Terry Cole Show is about. So before we get moving, I want to say thank you so much for all your feedback and all your um, comments and your questions. I read them all. I so appreciate it. I created a guide for you because there's a lot of information in this episode. So it is terrycole.com forward slash 248 because this is episode 248, if you can believe that. Um, so when you, you don't have to take notes, just listen and allow what I'm saying. I really want you to find yourself because in, in what I'm describing in this episode, because it can be very overwhelming and it's easy to confuse panic disorders with anxiety disorders and maybe just feeling anxious, maybe just feeling hormonal because that also creates anxiety. So I'm going to hit all of that right now. And hey, if you are watching this on YouTube, my YouTubers, if you haven't hit that bell and you haven't subscribed yet, please do so so you don't miss a thing. You'll get a little notice every time something new comes up on my channel and don't you want that? And the same thing for podcasters, please subscribe. And if you love the show, the best thing you can do for me is give it a good review on iTunes so that more people may see it. All right, moving into anxiety. I found um, this period of time, because I'm someone who's not normally anxious, and I do a lot of things to not be anxious, though. So let's talk about that, um, that there are many things. And when in, in the guide, I'll share them with you, but I'm also going to go over them in the episode themselves, things that you can do to um, lessen your anxiety. Because I really think we have to identify what is going on. There could be a lot of contributing factors of things that you're eating and drinking and lifestyle choices that could really be impacting your level of anxiety. And just some mindfulness and some, some sort of simple lifestyle changes can really make a difference in how anxious you are feeling. So let's just start with what is anxiety? Because I think that, you know, it's a word that a lot of people use, but let's get into what it actually is. Anxiety is when you feel nervous. It's a feeling of being restless. Um, it's a feeling of being tense, almost like impending doom. That can be anxiety, um, impending panic. Or, or that sense that something's wrong. You know, you have that like, it could be a pit in your stomach. For me, I get it more like a tenseness in my chest where I feel like something is wrong, but I don't know exactly what it is if I'm feeling anxious. Um, you can also have a lot of physical um, indications. So what are those? Uh, a rapid heartbeat, um, breathing, like hyperventilating, feeling like you can't get a good breath. You could be sweating. You might be um, shaking. You could feel weak. You ever get like weak in your legs when you're feeling that way or see those little black dots where you feel like, whoa, you might pass out, could have trouble sleeping, you could have um, upset gut, could also be like, like GI issues could also be a problem. And also wanting to avoid things that you think will trigger anxiety is another um, something that you may experience if you are actually anxious. So we may feel fear, like straight up fear right now with what's going on in the world, but that's different than anxiety because for a lot of people, anxiety is this, it's sort of this low grade companion, it's this low grade feeling or high grade feeling depending on how anxious you are, but it's almost like a companion where you're always sort of 
are feeling it. It's like a nervousness, an inability to, to deeply relax or an inability to get into that state, that feeling where all is well. It's almost like there's always something to worry about. A lot of us, this is learned behavior too. So it isn't just how we feel physically. If you came from a long line of worriers, let's say, this you, you were taught um, that that's the way to be caring. If you worry about other people, you might have had a parent who just modeled this behavior. So it isn't like they taught you and they wanted you to walk around feeling nervous or anxious. It's just the way that they were, you know, as kids, we're just little sponges and we absorb what's happening around us. And a lot of times unconsciously. So if you had, um, if you're a woman and you had a mom who was a worrier, it's almost like we have this unconscious identification with being female, um, being a mom, being a wife, a partner, being caring means worrying. So I think that that's important. I've given you a couple of questions in the uh, downloadable guide so you can sort of see, is this something that you kind of inherited in the way of worrying? Because the truth about worrying, and, and you know this somewhere, logically you know this, is that it doesn't do anything productive, right? It just creates a fearful feeling. What is worrying? It is projecting fearfully or catastrophically into the future. So that doesn't help. It, a lot of times, most of the time, when we're worrying, we're worrying about things probably 85% of the time that haven't happened. And a large percentage of those will never happen. So it's like we're wasting our youth and our beauty, spending time in this exhausting state of worrying about things that so much of the time will not even happen. And I would find with my therapy clients that it was almost like this, there was an illusion that if they worried about it, it would stop it from happening. So it's like this, this illusion of controlling something. But of course, logically, when you think about it, you know that that is not true. It, it does not stop. Bad things happen to good people all the time. Bad things happen to bad people all the time, right? But worrying doesn't help. I used to always say it was like worrying is like praying for the opposite of what you want to happen. Right? Because what we, we focus our time and our mind and our energy on a lot of times, we can create these things in our own lives. So I don't want to get into, uh, you know, the, the laws of attraction in this particular episode, although I do think that they'd be interesting to talk about in another one, because I don't talk about stuff like that much, although I do, do live my life and I do believe in the law of attraction and nothing is 100% like, oh, I think about it, I create it. Not that. Just that how we view ourselves and how we view our worthiness and how we experience our value, that has everything to do with what we have the power to make happen in our lives. Anyway, moving on. So we're going to get into and you'll figure out what sort of what is your downloaded blueprint around being anxious and or worrying. Um, because I believe that it can be learned behavior, but I also think that we can have a propensity towards anxiety if we come from a family that has a nervous system that is like that. So it's both, right? Nature and nurture both ways. Um, I think it's really important that we rule things out. So we got to look at what are you eating? What are you drinking? Are you sleeping? Um, are you doing recreational drugs? Do you smoke a lot of weed? Um, do you drink a lot? Because I've noticed with a lot of my clients that during this time, people who had a leaning towards using drugs or alcohol to numb feelings, it's almost like they didn't have to go to work anymore, even though they were working at home, but there was more of a freedom to indulge more in these behaviors than they normally would. And because they were feeling more anxious, it sort of makes sense. Um, so I want, you know, I have a couple of questions on the guide for you. So you can really see, I mean, if you're drinking two pots of caffeinated coffee a day, I'm not going to go with you have an anxiety disorder until we cut that down to two cups a day 
and then let's see if you still have a rapid heart rate and you find yourself sweating throughout the day and you feel anxious. Because if you still do, then perhaps there it is anxiety. But we won't know because two pots of caffeinated coffee a day would also mimic the same symptoms or many of the same symptoms of having actual anxiety. So what you eat, what you drink, how well you do or don't sleep, how much you indulge in uh, drugs and alcohol, those things all impact anxiety. Believe it or not, how much you hydrate. Being dehydrated absolutely exacerbates anxiety, there's no doubt. So you really gotta be drinking tons of water. So make sure that you're doing that. I know some people who don't drink water at all. In fact, I have a friend who for years, I'd be like, you need to drink water, you need to drink water. She's a you know a childhood friend for many decades at this point. And, you know, she would say, yeah, yeah, but she wouldn't. She would drink coffee in the morning. She hate, And she always would like sort of brag, like, I hate, I hate water, you know? I'm like, yeah, but your body is made of so much water. Like you actually need water. And then years later, maybe we were in our late 40s, I guess, by then, she was having these neurological problems. She was like, I keep getting on the subway going the wrong way from my apartment in Brooklyn. It's something is definitely wrong with my mind. I'm getting an, an MRI, blah, blah, blah. And then after hearing her symptoms, I just had this thought, I called her, I was like, let me ask you something. Seriously, how much water are you drinking? I think you're dehydrated. And she's like, oh my God, are you kidding me? No, she starts drinking water as we're talking. And she's like, oh my God, this, that was it. Because re severe dehydration can mimic a lot of things. Neurological problems is one of them. So it's really more serious than just like, if you don't like water, then figure it out some other way put fruit juice a little bit in the water, drink seltzer. Um, I mean, obviously don't drink soda because that's sugar and caffeine and that's not gonna help you, but there are things that you can do. Find other ways to hydrate your body, but you need to hydrate. It is really, really important. Um, I can't tell you how many clients came in feeling like they had anxiety stuff and the truth is they were not drinking enough water. So as we're moving down sort of um, ruling out, then we're going to do an inventory, right? And I've got, I've given you a couple of prompts and questions in the guide of where do you feel the most anxious? So is it around a particular person? Is it in a particular situation? Do you feel most anxious at work, but not at home? I mean, if you are still going to work, maybe you are still going to work. Um, so you'll answer those questions because it's really important to identify where is this happening? Why? is this happening? And when we can start to find patterns, you know, as a therapist, I'm always looking for patterns, patterns in your thoughts, patterns in your relationships, patterns in your behaviors. And this is one that you, only you can connect the dots and figure out what it is, but I can guide you to do it. Because once you figure out what's happening, it just, the more information we have, the easier it is to manage and sort of calm your anxiety um, if it isn't a, a physiological thing. And it may be, there's brain chemistry involved. Some people have anxiety and it is purely chemical and there are drugs for that and we can talk about that as well. But I just know that lifestyle has a lot to do with, at least in my 23 years of being a psychotherapist, there are so many things um, that clients and I have figured out together that they can do that absolutely lessened their anxiety. So let's move into some of those right now. Well, one is moving your body, exercising, stretching, sweating, getting tired, right? You're, you're actually discharging energy when you're being physical. So besides all the other zillions of benefits that you know that regular exercise does for you, there's something really good about exercising to lessen anxiety. So that's one thing that you can do. And if you're not in shape right now, it's okay. Just start small. Just start with 10 minutes a day. Make it then eventually be 20 minutes a day. Do not underestimate small steps because the truth is that they're really the only path to sustainable change. You know, we want it to be overnight. We want the magic bullet and the magic pill. We want to, you know, we, we want it to be real easy. And the reality is that there are some things and being physically fit is one of them. 
that there's actually, literally, no way around the middle of the process of doing it. No one can do it for you. Some people, if they have a lot of money, they can have a, a trainer come, you know, and, and teach them or do it virtually or whatever, you know, three or four times a week to make sure that they do it. Most of us have an exercise buddy or I, I have people in my life who have a similar lifestyle. So I'll say, hey, I've been slacking. Will you check in with me? Can we agree that we'll work out, you know, five days a week? Let's just say, take the weekends off or however you want to do it. But there's so, accountability for me is really big. And I'm definitely a group person where I'm not that much of a loner. Don't love it. Got to be honest. Like doing it on my own, I was fine. But I'd way rather walk five miles with Vic or hike five miles with my sister than do it on my own. It's really hard for me to motivate. I got to say, I've really struggled. Uh, sheltering in place was brutal, has been brutal for me. Because some people, they're real motivated at home. And I have all the things that I could need. But I love going normally. I love going to my gym and taking Zumba with people that I know that, you know, just I like the group vibe. The energy is great for me. And of course, I've had to adapt as we all have had to adapt. But I definitely am not working out as much as I was when I was able to just get in my car and go to the YMCA and see my friends and do my thing. So maybe I've got it to four times a week instead of six, three times a week. Listen, better than no times a week, right? Right. All right, so exercise is major. Um, good sleep hygiene. You've got to be sleeping. And a lot of times we think we can't sleep. Like, I don't know why I can't sleep. Well, uh, don't drink caffeine late in the day. Make sure that your room is actually dark. Do not have any devices in your room. Not a TV, not your laptop, not your phone. Don't have anything with those electrical blue lights. Wear an eye mask. I wear one every single solitary night and earplugs. You don't have to wear earplugs if you don't want to. I like to because I'm very sensitive to sound, even though I live in the country where literally there's no people besides me and Vic. But, you know, when you're sensitive to sound, someone breathing can be disruptive to your sleeping, you know. But learn about sleep hygiene. I'll give you some ideas in the guide. It's super easy. But these are things that maybe you're not thinking about or maybe you're not connecting to why you're sleeping like crap. And then there are some natural things to look at if you're not sleeping well, because that becomes um, a really bad cycle. Sleeping like crap, having anxiety, using caffeine to stay awake because you're tired, it just keeps on going. So you really got to figure out the sleep thing. It may be hormonal. Those of you going through menopause um, and, and even just being PMS can create a disruption in sleep. So there's lots of ways, natural ways to soothe your system. Chamomile tea, take a warm bath, but this all requires self-care and effort. So I'm giving you, you know, things. And if none of these things work for you, if you are having, uh, if you, if you know you have generalized anxiety and you're not on medication, maybe you should talk to your doctor about going on medication if your anxiety has skyrocketed throughout the last three or four months, right? Th those are all um, obviously always options. I'm giving you things on this episode that you can do as well. You know, panic disorders are also different than generalized anxiety because it's something that comes on fast and overtakes you. That's when you feel like you may faint. That's when you feel like your heart is beating out of your chest. It's so scary. If you've never had this experience, it really does feel like something is seriously wrong with you. If you have ever had this experience, you know it's terrifying. And even if someone says it is a panic attack, you want to like punch someone in the face because you're like, really? Because I felt like I was having a heart attack. How is that a panic attack? So it is so real. None of this is in your mind. I'm hoping that the suggestions that I'm giving you in this guide to basically manage and, and get a hold of your anxiety will help you. But none of it is in place of a doctor's care and none of it is in place of you should not start an exercise routine without talking to your doctor first if you are, in to, if you are completely out of shape. That goes for everything that I talk about on this show. This show, the Terry Cole Show, I hope it adds value to your life and that it's informative to you, but nothing takes the place of going to see your doctor or what your therapist has to say about it or what a psychiatrist has to say about it. There is no podcast or YouTube show that takes the place of that. And that includes this one. Talking though really does help. 
So if you think, you know, you've been thinking about therapy, want to get into therapy, um, I am now associated and have a partnership with BetterHelp. So if you want to find out about virtual therapy that I think is really fabulous, just go to terrycole.com forward slash better help and all the information that you need is right there. They set you up usually same day with a therapist that you can text or email with or do like FaceTime or Skyping with. It really is modern therapy and you can do it for as long or as little as you want and it is way less expensive than seeing a therapist in person. So it's win, win, win from the comfort of your own couch. Talking is good. Journaling is good. Writing about how you're feeling. Anything that will get those feelings up and out can be helpful. So I'm giving you all of these ideas and suggestions and a bunch of other ones in the guide that goes along with this week's episode of The Terry Cole Show. If you like this show, please share it in your world. Just share it on your social media platforms. Um, tag me if you're listening to it. Tag me and put me in your IG story so that I can say hello and thank you because I so appreciate it. It's so much fun to see what you have to say about it. I love looking at your IG stories. Um, so tag me so I know that you're doing that. I do appreciate it. I hope that you guys really learned something from this episode because my whole trip in life, as you know, is to lessen your suffering and to elevate your joy. I'm always looking to teach you things, tools, techniques, and strategies that you can do for yourself to lessen your own suffering and to increase your joy. So drop comments. You know I read them all. I want to know what you think. I hope you guys have an amazing week. And as always, take care of you.